Hello. This lecture is about representative democracy, or as I at one point dubbed it, representing whom. One of the things that I hope is clear to you is that we do not live in a true democracy in the United States. A true democracy would mean that every single one of us voted on every issue that pertained to the national government. If nothing else, the congressional simulation should, I hope, when we're done with it, show you that that would be very, very difficult. If for no other reason, then try to imagine how difficult will, it, it would be to try to achieve consensus across the millions of people that live in the United States. In addition, just the le amount of time that it would take and the amount of knowledge it would take would probably keep us from doing our other daily jobs. What we have instead is what's known as a representative democracy. We vote not for the actual laws that are made, but for people whose job it will be to represent us when they make laws and govern. This leads to the rather important first question. When we elect legislators or others, what exactly are they representing? If you've read the book, you know that there are at least four different potential answers to this question. One question or one way to look at this is whether they look at national interests or local interests. And when we elect legislators even to the National Congress, this can be a rather interesting tension. Most notably, I think, and this has actually remained an issue for the last 10 years or more, actually 20 years or more, is, for example, the decommissioning of military bases. Those of you who have paid attention to politics in Pittsburgh lately know that they're, for example, t planning, uh, talking about shutting down the air wing that's based at Pittsburgh International Airport. This is an interesting issue because from a national perspective, it might make a lot of sense to shut that base down. It would save a lot of money out of the national budget, and people have argued that, that those services could be done elsewhere, perhaps at a larger existing base where they wouldn't have to pay for additional housing and so on for additional people. They could just put them into the base. From a local level, however, local legislators are very much fighting to keep that base open. Why? Because local interests are very much served by that base. That base employs people. It gives them jobs. It may, gives puts people in the area that are going to spend money at local stores and local restaurants and so on. A, na a legislator has to balance these two issues. Should that legislator vote for the national interest, which might be to try to save money by closing that base, or for the local interest, which wants to keep that base open because it helps the local economy? That's one tension in who the re who legislators represent. A second que question or tension is the tension that comes out of the Edmund Burke readings. Should we should legislators represent what we say or what we need? Um, this is summarized very well in Edmund Burke, but it's important to realize that this also happens even today. Um, the best example for that might be something like, well, when I lived in Ohio, it was something like tax cuts. Um, tax cuts, uh, local school districts had to be funded by local taxes, and every 10 years or so, that those taxes went up for election. Now, on some level, it is in everybody's best interest to have a well-funded school system. That's what we need. We need a good-funded school system so that kids can learn, so that kids can get jobs, so that you know, when I go to my doctor or to somebody who's going to fill my orders, I have some assurance that they know what they're doing. That's what we need. On the other hand, um, tax cuts, tax issues in Ohio were particularly contentious, and so every time people had the opportunity to vote, they voted based on what they themselves wanted as opposed to what they needed, and they wanted to pay fewer taxes. This is the tension between being, as Burke called it, sort of a guardian or a representative. A guardian would say, we need to vote for what's in the, be uh, would need to do what's in the best interest of all the people as a unit, whereas a representative would vote based on what each individual said, which was, we need lower taxes.
An additional tension within each legislator as to who they're representing is the question of political parties, and we'll go into greater depth about that in a few weeks. But it's important to realize that, in part because we have basically two very large parties, parties tend to be sort of catch-alls and don't necessarily have a coherent ideology. Um, so that when somebody says they are, well, the in the current election cycle, Mitt Romney is a very good example. Mitt Romney, a, rep a Republican from Massachusetts, is being Yell, is being called incredibly liberal by other Republicans, in large part because Massachusetts tends to be a much more liberal state. There are Republicans who say that they should re that all legislators should vote for Republicans, regardless of whether their individual constituency might be a little bit more conservative or a little bit more liberal. And while I'm talking about Republicans, it's important to realize that the same holds true for Democrats as well. Political parties tend to have one set of ideologies, but it's important to realize that people in different areas may vote very differently than their party would sort of dictate. Finally, there is a question about whether legislators should vote based on their own beliefs. And this is something that's been highlighted, especially in the last, again, two decades or so, because in, the, in sort of very personalized campaigns. If you've watched the election campaigns at all recently, you'll sort of see that, that there's this sort of tendency in these campaigns to sort of say that we should all vote for Senator Smith because Senator Smith is exactly the way you are and Senator Smith believes the same things you do. Well, this is okay, except that this may clash with a number of other things, including, you know, maybe Senator Smith doesn't always believe the same things you do. Maybe Senator... Maybe Senator Smith is Muslim and you are Christian, but for the most part, Senator Smith has all kinds of other issues, believes all kinds of other things. Um, should they vote based on their conscience or should they vote on something else? These four sort of questions about what legislators rep represent, whether they represent the national interest or the local interest, whether they represent what they what we say or what we need whether they represent their party or their individual constituents and whether they represent their own beliefs these are all very interesting tensions that kind of go into almost every decision that a legislator may make um, some vote very clear are very consistent in that they will vote one particular way or another but for a large number of them they will vote different ways on different issues based on whether they think it's something that's a local issue or whether it's something that they feel they have a very strong conscience, it's something that appeals to their conscience. That's important to keep in mind. The second question when it comes to legislators is the question of whom they are representing. And in particular for the House of Representatives, a, rep, a legislator is supposed to represent their district. Now, your book has a very nice picture of the original gerrymander. And the gerrymander sort of came into existence. It's on page 373, if you want to take a look at your book, page 373. What that is a picture of, and sometimes it's hard to tell now, those those sort of state those towns that are sort of highlighted in dark sort of become this rather interesting dragon-like creature, that was one congressional district. And the cartoonist who drew this cartoon back in 1812 was talking about how very strangely this district was made, that it sort of cuts, out of, cuts into and out of some neighborhoods and so on. This idea of gerrymandering, although everybody always sort of claims that it's a very bad thing, has not gone away. Um, and it, it exists for a number of reasons. Gerrymandering is about basically about reapportionment. And for Congress, we're required to reapportion every 10 years. Reapportioning is the rather fancy term for adjusting the boundaries of congressional districts to, rep to represent population. As one state's population goes up or another state's population goes down, according to the Constitution, they may get more or fewer con 
representatives in Congress because representation in Congress is based on population. It would be one, easy enough to sort of say, well, okay, we're going to go through, and since we get an, since we get an extra congressperson, or in the state of Pennsylvania, what happens more often is that we lose representatives in Congress because we lose population compared to the rest of the country. It would be one easy thing to just sort of say, okay, well, we're going to take a look at the map of Pennsylvania, and we're just going to say every so many thousand people gets one, and we're just going to adjust the borders. But that's not usually what happens. What usually happens is that the this readjustment of the electoral districts is done based on who is well it's done through the state governor's office and so the state governor who is representative of a political party tries to help out the fellow members of that political party in the real in redrawing those districts. What that means is that first and foremost that that particular governor is going to probably try to preserve the seats uh, and the districts of all of those people who are currently in Congress from his or her political party. Beyond that, they're going to do a couple of other things. They're trying to going to try to divide opposition districts so that instead of having one large district that traditionally voted for the other party, they might split that district up so that you know maybe one quarter of that district is part of one. Uh, part of one part, one district, and one quarter is in another, so that what used to be a very strong opposition district is now four very strong opposition cells, each in a district that's controlled by the opposite party. Alternatively, they may try to combine the opposition to try to eliminate a seat which means that if there's like a little tiny bit of a par party stronghold in one district and a little tiny uh, stronghold in another one, they might try to combine those into one strong opposition district as opposed to two weaker opposition districts. I'm going to try to put up some, some graphics on the web to sort of give you an idea of how all of this works out. Moreover, there have been there's been a history of creating special districts for minorities. And this happened in particular in a state I once lived in, in Maryland, where there was one district drawn rather particular, that, that seemed rather particularly to appeal to one particular de um, demographic. In this case, it was the urban African American district. It's a prob creating districts for minorities, be they racial, be, which usually happens for racial minorities, but can happen for others as well, is controversial for a number of reasons. First and foremost is, of course, because it's a political party gerrymander, so it sort of tends to sort of create issues for the opposition parties. But it's also controversial for a number of reasons, for some other reasons. These gerrymanders that are based on on sort of racial uh, demographics may have little correlation with anything beyond race. So that, for example, the district that I have posted up about Maryland included some very rural people and a whole lot of people who lived in suburban Washington, D.C. These people had very little in common in terms of where they were living, what was important to them. You know, one came from a very well, very pop, one area was very populous and had a very over, had a school district that was bursting at the seams and had, you know, all kinds of other things. Also had a lot of government programs, had a lot of need for federal transportation grants. The other half of that district was very rural, had very small schools, didn't have a lot of federal transportation money, had a whole lot of county roads and everything else, didn't have a whole, and the people in these two sides of this district had nothing in common except that they were mostly African American. The other problems with creating a racial gerrymander is that these districts may cause people to lose traditional leaders or get very weak representation. The district that I showed you has historically had the same person time and time again. Um, arguably, he may have been somewhat good, but uh, these pe he came from one particular, the sort of more urban end of that district. The people at the rural end of that district had strong local leaders who wound up not getting a voice because this one person in the urban section of the area of that 
gerrymander district had most of got most of the votes. Finally, the problem with a racial gerrymander is that it perpetuates the idea that different groups cannot get along and may increase, in fact, the, uh, the demand for more gerrymanders. The idea is that, for example, if this one gerrymander for one particular ethnic minority was passed and people don't get along within that district, well, if they get an extra representative next, after the next census, they may demand that that particular gerrymandered district be split to create one district that's more urban and black and one that's more rural and black. Or they, or other minorities may cr want to get similar attention, so they may want, for example, a Korean American district or something like that. Gerrymanders occur in large part because of the way um, how members of the House of Representatives are elected and because they are elected based on their districts. It's important to realize that that's one thing that's going on when, pe when representatives are trying are making their decisions in Congress. Both members of the House of Representatives and members of the Senate tend to believe rather strongly that they are representing their constituents. That means that they are representing their voters. Um, this may for us be somewhat intuitive, but it's important to realize that that means that on some level their interests are somewhat biased and skewed. It means that they're not necessarily representing their whole of their district because representing voters means that they're ignoring a number of other people who may be also living in that in their district. For example, People who are legal immigrants are not being represented in Congress. And it's important to realize that legal immigrants may pay taxes, may collect Social Security, may send children to school, and so on, but they have no voice, they have no representation in Congress. More important, also, it means that people in Congress are not representing anyone who can't legally vote. This includes, of course, everyone under the age of 18, but it also includes people who have been convicted of a felony. Um, and this becomes really important because for people have estimated that in some parts of the country, as many as one in 10 adult African Americans has been convicted of a felony. Their voices are effectively lost because even though they may have con been convicted of this felony 30 years ago, they still can't vote, and so their interests are not represented in Congress. What this means also is that voter drives among the underrepresented are particularly important. Why? Because if, if members of the Senate and members of the House of Representatives represent the people who vote, regardless of whether they vote for them or for the opponent, then it's very important to have those people who would not otherwise vote have at least let people know that they exist, that they are a member of the constituency. And that has led to a number of people who have sort of a social have a sort of social justice streak to do voter drives among people who would be underrepresented. This includes rep voter drives among um, in California about 15 years ago. They did voter drives among the homeless. They've also done ho voter drives among the poor. And one of the first things that a lot of people do after people are registered as new citizens is they immediately give them a voter registration card. When I say that members of Congress, both Senate and House, represent their constituents, it's important to realize that they also wind up representing only a segment of their constituents. They, while they technically represent their entire district and more technically represent their constituents, meaning the people who can vote in that district, they most clearly represent the majority of people who voted on the day of the election that brought them to office. And I mention this because this may be different from the majority in that district in general. Um, about 15 years ago, there was a group called the Gray Panthers. They're not called the Gray Panthers anymore, but they still exist. This is a group of older people, senior citizens, people who are members of AARP and other groups, 
Um, they are significant because they are the senior citizen voting block, and senior citizens, for a variety of reasons, vote more consistently, more often, more regularly than any other segment of the population. Um, so legislators have tended to pay more attention to them because they know that they can always, that the, that the quote-unquote Grey Panther vote is something to be reckoned with. The importance of recognizing who representatives vote for also means that things like voter access becomes very important. It becomes very important to know who is on the voter list, who is, uh, what the conditions are for voting, whether or not polls are open at times that are accessible for everyone, and whether there's enough uh, um, availability of absentee ballots. For example, if you could, uh, and I know there are a number of people in this class who are working, if you could imagine that polling places would only be open from the hours of, say, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., that would probably keep almost everyone who had an office job from voting. And that may sound absolutely absurd, but realize that, you know, a lot of people, this is a very real issue. Imagine if, conversely, they had polling places that were open and they sort of said, oh, well, we want to make sure that everyone who works can vote. We'll keep our polling places open from 6 p.m. until 11 p.m. at night. Well, people who worked swing shifts overnight or people who were, for whatever reason, just went to bed very early wouldn't be able to vote. Since representatives vote vote based on sort of the people who got them into office, the majority of people who vote on a particular day, it's important to make sure that everyone has as good an opportunity to vote as possible. This also, the idea of v legislators representing the people, the majority of the voters who vote on that day, also makes that question of persistent minorities a very real question. If you have a group that is in, in your district that is consistently, say, 33% of the voters, and this can be any group, really, if you think hard enough about it. We usually think about it in terms of racial minorities, but it can also be something like working mothers or stay-at-home mothers or senior citizens or any other group that might not be the majority of the district but would be a fairly consistent minority. Um, these groups often tend to feel that they are underrepresented, and this is actually one of the reasons why gerrymanders came into being. Um, but we can, but whether or not gerrymanders resolve that issue is a very real question. That is who they represent, who legislators represent. My final sort of point or sort of section that I want to talk about today is or in this lecture, is how legislators represent people. Um, and it's important to realize that they do a couple of things. We, of course, because we refer to them as legislators, we assume that they represent people through their legislation, through the bills that they pass and the work that they do to benefit the people in their home districts. And they also tend to represent people through committees, which is going to be the subject of the next lecture. But it's important to realize, and your book goes into this in some detail, that mostly they represent by their district by trying desperately to stay in office as a representative of this district. When I do this lecture, I'm never quite sure whether this is sort of a well-duh moment for everyone who's reading the book or whether this is somewhat shocking. It's important to realize that this idea that legislators basically make their number one priority trying to stay in office. This came out of a book that was published about 40 years ago by a man named Daniel Mayhew. It's called Congress, the Electoral Connection. When this book came out 40 years ago, it was shocking to people because everybody assumed that everybody, that, that people who were in Congress were there to represent their districts and it never occurred to them that they were there and their number one, that they saw their number one job as staying in office. But it's important to realize that a number of the things that we would associate with being a good representative actually also serves to help people stay in, off, in office. 
So, for example, if you've ever gotten a mailing from your representative talking about the things that he or she has done in Congress or um, the bills that are coming up or wanting to do some other thing to connect with the voters, that's something that both serves the purpose of being a representative but also helps keep that person in office because it keeps their name in the minds of the voters. When Congress people respond to letters that's one of the things that they do to help stay in office. When they meet with constituents, it helps remind all the constituents that they are there as their representative. The slightly more controversial things that they do that also are related to the office are proposing legislation of local interest. And they will sometimes do this regardless of whether they think this particular bill will pass or not. Um, so as long as they can sort of make sure that they can put something in that will help their constituency or at least put their constituency's name in the congressional record, um, they will do this. And in fact, the congressional record is filled with um, a sort of statements where co members of Congress stand and sort of honor things that are happening in their local districts. People who have turned 100, for example, or sc uh, teacher, school teachers who have won national awards. That's part of what they do to sort of stay in office. The most famous thing and most controversial thing that legislators do to stay in office is, of course, the quote-unquote pork barrel project. And at the risk of being somewhat controversial, I'll say that you all out in, um, at Mount Aloysius are probably very familiar with a pork barrel project, which is Interstate 99 slash Route 220 which, if you've ever gone down it, actually bears the name of the legislator who got all the money passed through Congress to build that highway. That highway probably actually created a whole lot of jobs in the area and is probably a very valuable access route, but was incredibly controversial when it was first founded because people sort of said it's a highway that, you know, does not connect the major cities and everybody in Congress at the time basically was sort of taking a look at whether we should be spending money to connect the, the larger cities in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, or whether we should build this particular highway. That highway is an example of a pork barrel project. Other things that Congress do, to, con people in Congress do to stay in office are to do things like using perks. They attend local events. They honor local constituents. They do other things like that. We can talk about whether, I mean, like I said, May Yu's book was controversial when it first came out, and it was controversial for two reasons. Well, three, really. The first is that it was controversial because people asked if this was an effective way of being a legislator. Are all of these things effective as a means of staying in office? Um, are they effective as a means of legislating or representing a local constituency? And is this effective in helping democracy out? Another reason why it was controversial is because people sort of said, well, is this really fair? And it's important to remember that one of the things that helps get people elected is name recognition. Um, we see this sometimes in foreign countries, um, I believe it was Liberia not too long ago, the runner-up for their presidential election was actually a very famous soccer player. Why? Because in a field of 20 presidential candidates, everyone recognized the name of the soccer player. Didn't necessarily mean what he was, would be a good president or not. Um, that is one extreme. But it's important to realize that sort of, you know, when, when people go to, a, to vote, they're sometimes overwhelmed and they're confronted with a ballot w which may have multiple names on it. And they're going to look through and sort of see people's names on the ballot and say, well, John Smith, oh, wait, I've heard of John Smith. That must be a good person to vote for. The, all these things that members of Congress do to stay in office proposing legislation of local interest, doing pork barrel projects, return, replying to letters, getting their name in the paper, and so on, that gives them name recognition. Whether or not it's good name recognition is somewhat unclear. But it's also important to realize that this may mean that they drown out other very good candidates who are out campaigning 
but can't compete against two years of just people being legislators. People on the opposite end of that, uh, of that debate will argue, well, of course it's fair if someone is being a good legislator by, do, by proposing all these things that are in the local interest, surely that person should stay in office. But it is sort of, do, people have argued that it tips the balance a little bit. Mayhew's book is perhaps most important to us now um, in light of recent controversies. The second half of Mayhew's book initially talked about how this stay in office mentality t affected Congress's ability to work together. And we're now going sort of full circle back to sort of Edmund Burke's speech. Edmund Burke talked very clearly about how it was important to be a legislator and to vote for what was in the best interest of the people. However, if most of Congress is vote especially the House of Representatives, is working primarily to stay in office, they're going to probably spend a lot more time fo focusing on what is in the best interest of their constituency or more particularly their voter, their block of voters. And if their block of voters is a little bit extreme or is particularly vigilant on particular issues, members of Congress who are seeking re-election may not be able to vote on the way that they believe is in the national interest if they're trying to make sure that they vote in the interests or based on the people who will get them re-elected. So we're back to that clash. What, I've hoping you, ho what I hope you've gotten out of today's, this particular lecture, is the ways in which Congress, uh, individual representatives in Congress, have sort of divided loyalties as they try to make decisions about how to legislate. The next le lecture will talk more about how actual legislation happens, and then we will hopefully be able to do a simulation that talks about, that will make all of this hopefully seem a little bit more clear to you all. Hope you have, have enjoyed this time, and have a good day.